It's a very good question. Um, well, first thing is crop, right? We need to adjust the composition. And as it turns out, this tool right here is the crop tool. And the reason it looks like a funny looking uh, square thing is because there's actually a physical device called a crop tool, which you move it in and out, and it makes uh, various rectangles all the same aspect ratio. So anyway, this say you might say, oh, well, that looks like a perfectly good picture. But you know, there's lots of background, lots of foreground, distracting hat. So we can just draw a little crop box like this, say. And now you have a, a much more dramatic picture of of the girl. Right? Can I try to get you to wear this mic as well? Oh. Oh, I didn't wear it? OK. Did it fall off? I thought it was. And if we can get it up on your collar, that would be a lot better. <laughs> I can get it up on my collar. Does that work? Yeah, just leave it hanging out over there. Thank you. Twice the mics. Double the mics, double the pleasure. OK. So, um, so cropping is pretty much the first thing you do to, uh, you know, to take a, a snapshot and turn it into uh, you know, a nice photograph. Because a lot of people take pictures you know, without zooming in on something, or you know, they just weren't close enough. Or maybe there's only one interesting part of the photo. Got a crop. It's all about the crop. And um, next, levels. Now, how many of you here actually have Photoshop? Anybody? Does anybody else use any other photo editors? Paintshop Pro. Paintshop Pro, and you guys? The GIMP. The GIMP? Uh, Photoshop the GIMP. Photoshop the GIMP. OK. Um, uh, well, I, I've never used Paintshop Pro, but um, the GIMP has exactly the, the same tools, um, just in different places on the menu. Dialog boxes might be named differently, but it's exactly the same thing. All right. So, again, we got levels. So, we got a nice picture of a pretty girl, but there's lots of distracting background here, which you really don't need. So now it's a picture of the girl, not a picture of you know a girl standing in the backyard with a whole bunch of junk. But the problem is her face around here kind of dark. So we want to do levels. We go to image, adjustments, and levels, or control L. So let me move this dialog box so that it's more prominent. OK. You've got three major controls here. Input levels, output levels, and channel. In this case, all we care about is input levels. Now, the input levels themselves have three major controls here. One of them, the first box, corresponds to that, that dot there. That's called the black level. This middle one here corresponds with the... Uh, the middle control, and that's called gamma. And then on the right, that's called white point. So here, let me show you what it does. Moving this white point here basically just um, tells Photoshop uh, which level you want to be absolute white. So in this case, uh, we want you know we want to move it over till the image is just light enough. Now gamma, it's hard to explain what it does, so I won't. But um, if you move it to the left, your image gets lighter. Move it to the right, your image gets darker. In this case, you want to move it to the left, and voila, you know, girl's got a face with detail. And now this, see, we can slide that in. And now we've got um, a nice image. And if I uh, undo, then you can see there's actually quite a difference between the original and the new one. Yeah, you have a question. How do you feel about auto levels? Um, uh, auto levels actually doesn't do very much. Um, here, I'll 
I'll show you. Okay? That's all the auto levels did here. Right? It turned it from being um, sepia-toned, which was uh, an intentional option I set on the camera, to being um, a neutral gray. And why did it do that? Here, I'll show you. Because what auto levels does is... Um, It just takes this, uh, this white thing and moves it, uh, you know, far enough left to, um, you know, to the point where it would, um, you know, hit these, uh, these bumps here on the histogram, and it does the same thing with the black. Well, in this case, the histogram, um, you know, already has enough uh, um, detail on the, on the right side, and it's got enough detail on the left side. So auto levels doesn't really do anything with it. And um, it's been my experience that um, most pictures that were taken with the digital camera, auto levels doesn't help with. Okay, so um, our next important thing here is color balance. And quite simply, that's for um, balancing your color. Uh, does anybody here know what the white balance on their camera does? Okay, most people don't know. Well, basically, um, to your eye, anything can look white if, uh, if it's just the brightest thing there. So, uh, you know, so these incandescent lights up in the top of the room, they look white, and the sun looks white, but they're actually vastly different colors. And your camera doesn't really know which white your eye is looking at, so it just has to guess. Or you can tell it. Now, um, in this case here, that's a cute picture of a baby, right? But we can do better. Why? Because um, the white balance is off. And so we can easily fix the white balance by going images, adjustment, color balance, or control B. And how do you do all these settings? Well, uh, actually, there's nothing scientific about it. I just uh, move them left and right until you know I see it get either better or worse. So in this case, right? I'm sorry. Well, well, monitors don't actually have a white balance adjustment. What they have is a white point setting. So you tell the monitor, you know, when the computer tells you to display white, I want it to look like the sun outside or I want it to look like the sun outside on a cloudy day, or, or, or something like that. But you're not actually um, adjusting the white balance of the monitor. So, um, okay, so it turns out moving this yellow slider over looks, makes it look pretty good, although not on that. Unfortunately, our, 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 our projector is very poorly calibrated. Um, But, uh, so anyway, you know, I can move the magenta slider over and see, you know, if it helps, or the green slider. Okay, green, usually you don't want to add green to a picture because pictures of people look very bad if they're green. Um, but, uh, again, cyan can kind of make people look sickly, but red, yeah, red, you know, makes people look normal. So... If you look at it, uh, you know, you look at the picture up here, you can see that that looks like much more natural skin tones than what we had before. And if I undo, you see this looks like, you know, nice looking people. And in comparison, this looks like kind of sick looking people, right? But we're not done. We can still do levels. I'll move my white point over here. And now it looks like the room was fairly bright, right? And I can adjust this slider here till I see something that looks good. And I might say, okay, well, I want the face to be really light, but that makes the picture washed out. So then I'll take my black slider and move it in. So instead of having a washed out picture, it's a nicely adjusted contrast. And you can see the difference here before and after. Unfortunately, it doesn't look as good on the projector as it does in real life, but um, just have to, we'll just have to live with that. Okay. 
and let's go to the next thing here. Hue, saturation. I will open a picture here. Okay, so uh, for people who don't know color theory, um, hue is basically what we what we call color. Like red is a hue, green is a hue, blue is a hue, white and black are not hues. Um, and saturation is basically the difference between brown and yellow. So a really saturated brown is actually yellow, and a very unsaturated yellow is brown. Um, and so um, what we have in this case is a fairly ordinarily looking picture of um, some pastels. And first thing we'll do is do some levels. And you can see we, we have plenty of room to move this white point over here. And now we've got some nice brighter looking pastels. But allow us to go to the uh, hue and saturation um, adjustment dialog here. And you see we can shift the hues, which very rarely does anything useful. Um, we can increase the saturation, which makes it very bright and colorful. Or we can desaturate all the way to black and white. In this case, we want colorful. So I can drag it out to, say, here. And we've got uh, a nice, uh, much more lively image. So from uh, a little bit dull to more lively. Unfortunately, um, this projector doesn't show it as well as I would like it to. OK. Um, OK. So now we have um, um, an interesting technique here. You know, a lot of people um, love uh, to take pictures with film instead of digital because of, um, you know, the look of black and white film. And uh, fortunately, digital photographers there um, are at parity with them because you can make anything look uh, just the same as they can. And uh, let me show you how. Okay. So um, every image uh, in a computer is composed of three channels, a red channel, a green channel, and a blue channel. And in fact, if we go to the uh, channels window here, then uh, Photoshop will allow me to select, uh, select them and show you. So this is what the red channel looks like. This is what the blue channel looks like, uh, green channel, and here's the blue channel. And um, one thing that you'll notice is that the skin tones and the red channel look very, very smooth. It turns out that um, most people's blemishes and their skin are actually in the green and blue channels. And we can use that to our advantage here. So uh, let me show you the feature called the channel mixer. Now, uh, what, this, uh, particular uh, what this particular feature does is it allows you to um, individually mix the red, green, and blue channels um, however you want. And in this case, you want to make it monochrome. And uh, tell it how much of each channel to add in to make a nice looking picture. And so let's say we can choose this. Are we getting feedback here? I can wait. Can you? It's aliens invading. Okay, no more feedback. Okay, so, um, so we've successfully mixed our channels to go from uh, decent color to um, nice looking black and white. And of course, then we can go into our levels here and adjust it as we see fit. 
And um, you might say, gee, that's a funny looking picture. There's a out of focus baby's head and somebody's um, wrist and a watch. I don't like that so much. Well, that's where cropping comes in. We just select the interesting part here. And now it's a cute little picture of a baby's hand holding her mommy's hand instead of the funny looking out of focus baby and some hands, right? So uh, what I thought I would do is um, uh, look at some audience submitted pictures here and demonstrate uh, these techniques with you know, other people's average looking images. As it turns out, I'm not so good at making um, average looking images, so. Are you on the internet right now? Uh, you mean, do I have internet access? Yeah. You can pull some off my side if you want. Oh, okay, well here. Um, this uh, gentleman gave me his compact flash card, so I will, I will look there to see if Oh, we lost our VGA. Okay. Um, Drive E, okay. Can we access it? We may not be able to access the... Oh, no, we can access it. Okay, Photoshop's dialog is not very good. Okay, so here's a photo. <laughs> right? It's a guy in a room a at a hacker con. We've got, um, you know, this, this funny looking curtain in the back here, this column, window, distracting out of focus foreground image. We can fix it. There we go. Right? See, it's no longer, you know, a guy sitting in a room. It's a picture of a guy communicating. <laughs> and we can crop it further. Okay. So, now we can go into our levels here. Make his skin tones look nice. Okay. And now let's um, check out our saturation. Bring out the color in his skin. Okay. So there you go. But maybe you say, gee, you know, I think it makes a much better statement if it's in black and white. So, you know, so let's say we do some red. Now, it turns out the least amount of noise on a digital camera is in the green channel because there's twice as many green pixels as there are uh, red and blue. So, in this case, we'll up the green channel a lot. There's a little bit of blue. Okay, so now we have a you know nice piece of artwork instead of you know just the guy in the middle of a room giving the finger. Um, and here we can show what it looked like before and after. Well, actually, I guess to be fair, we really have to show the whole thing, right? Before and after. Before, and after. Okay.
Exactly. Exactly. Okay, let's see if... Is that bad? That's kind of a cool effect, right? See, if we look at the, uh, the different color channels, we can see where the smoke comes out the best. All right, and you can see this is the red channel, um, which you can see because it says red up there. There's green, and there's blue. And in this case, it looks like blue is the, um, the best channel for the smoke here. Now, this is sort of tricky. How do we crop this? Well, we can get rid of the distracting bed and people. Does this help? Hmm. There we go. And then we can bring out the smoke effect. Well, okay. So there's not much you can do with this picture. But there's a uh, quick demonstration of it. Let's go to a... Um, See thumbnails. Okay. Now again, what's the first thing we do? Crop. Okay, and then uh, so we draw out our box. Now, as it turns out, you can quite conveniently resize it like so, <coughs> and um, at least in Photoshop, you can rotate it like this in case your, uh, your image is, you know, not exactly uh, plumb. Um, and we double click to get our nice crop box. And unfortunately, there's a fellow back here who's kind of hard to see. So maybe if we take our gamma it gets a little easier to see, but the room gets washed out. So we increase the shadow, and now we have a face you can see and more contrast. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other great things you can do, like uh, you know you can remove this guy's red eye and um, you know take some pictures of him uh, where his eyes are open and copy them over here. But you know. That takes lots of time. Who's got time for all that, right? We got pictures to process. You know, we want to be done in five minutes or less. Okay. Does red eye always take you a long time to fix? Um, no, red eye uh, actually there's there there's a red eye removal function. Um, but uh, that's not one of the most important five features of Photoshop. Um, Although, if your image does have red eye, I recommend removing it. Oops. Ah, okay. Nice landscape of a city. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Layers. Okay. Well, here. Um, I will um, process this image and show some idea of how layers work. Okay. So uh, you'll notice this picture's got lots of black stuff on the top, which we really don't care about. So we just crop it out. And we, now we have a nice panorama of, of, I don't know, parking lot, the city, whatever. And we can lighten things up here so we have more detail. And there you go. We've got a nice panorama of the parking lot. Took almost no work. Um, here. Uh, before I forget, I will eject this guy's. Ooh. That's what you think.
Okay, did anybody bring any more uh, images for me to look at? I've got some on the web. Okay, sure. Oops, let's not go there. Okay, um, what's your website? Flash. Okay, does that look right? The, uh, oh, okay. Do you know uh, your IP address? Maybe that doesn't matter. Um, okay, let's go to properties. Do you know a DNS server? Start Internet Explorer. I don't. Okay. Hmm. And a USB key? Yeah. Huh. Bring it up. Even better. Okay. Uh, this drive, okay. USB. Okay. Oh, you know what? Um. Okay. Uh, what do you want me to look in? There's. Which one? Um, oh. And there's one guy. Should we look at that? Oh, no, okay. Pretty much it. You go to the Clippings Hackers talk idea of the Hackers Conference. Just scroll through. Oh, okay. Well, here. Let's, uh... Copy, mm. paste. Okay, so here's a nice image, but to me it looks a little bit dull. And if we um, go in here, we can make it lighter, increase the contrast, bring out some more detail. Okay, and. Um, I don't know about you, but this building in the background is kind of distracting me. So, as a matter of fact, I would crop it even tighter. Unless you need to show the context of, like, say, what building it's in front of. You don't need the building, right? People are going to look at the building instead of your subject here. So, mm, make it as tight as we want. Now, um, 
it's much better. Well, maybe not much better, but it's better than it was before. So um, let's see if there's any other good pictures. Oh, this is interesting. Well, it looks like that was intentional. Here's another picture. And again, green crop. Do we really need the um, it's back there? Back of the chair. No, because that's really what's important. All the other stuff on the sides, not important at all. Now, um, if I were taking this picture again, or if I were taking it the first time, I might think, gee, there's uh, lots of space between them. Maybe I can get them to move closer, but hey, you know, you can't go back and retake the picture. So got to work with what we have. In this case, cropping works. Let's see what this is. Ah, okay. It was the sculpture garden of the guy who uh, found the geocities. Interesting. Sculpture garden. So in this case, uh, I don't know, there's some lighting that we might be able to fix. Bring out some detail. Well, unfortunately, this is like a a, a 0 0.02 megapixel image, so there isn't there isn't that much we can do with it. Um, but uh, you know what I would do uh, if I had more pixels, I'd crop it like right, probably right here, because we don't really need this tree. And believe it or not, we have this big tall vertical thing here, like this. It does not need to be in the center of the frame. As a matter of fact, um, I think it looks better with it off to the uh, off to the side there. Okay. Okay. Now here's an interesting one. Paste. Okay, now you'll notice this isn't standing straight up and down. Maybe you don't want it to, maybe you do. In this case, we can fix that by rotating our crop box slightly and then cropping it. So you made the crop box small to line it up next to the sculpture. Right, right. Now there are other ways of rotating, but in this case, um, this is how I like doing it. So. And as a matter of fact, I think I want this, um, this major sculpture to be more prominent in the frame, so I'll crop even more off here. And that's a uh, much more artistic um, presentation than what we had before. You know, you may not agree, but um, if anybody would like to come up and uh, try their hand at it, um, I'd be... Um, Please do allow them. Nobody? Nobody wants to? Okay. Um, now, somebody uh, before asked about layers. Um, uh, I must admit, uh, you know, when they were first introduced in like Photoshop 3, I thought, you know, gee, things are just getting out of hand now. You know, there's all these complicated features and they're bloating the software, but it turns out they're actually very handy. Um, now here, let me give you a quick demonstration. Okay, so what we have here is a blank canvas. And um, this is called a background. You can put anything you want on it. In this case, why don't we add a little picture of a sculpture that we can move around. And um, as it turns out, this little image right here 
is uh, is a layer, like uh, you know, like a piece of acetate or or something like that, sitting on the background. If I go to the layers channel here, then you can see um, this guy is corresponds to this layer, and. Now we can drag this other thing from Photoshop and voila, now we've got two layers that we can move around and see they act just like different layers and we can reorder them like this. So now this guy's on top and um, the beauty of layers is that it allows you to have, um, it's, it's essentially like having multiple objects. Um, and one image that you can move around. So you might, um, um, you know, you could easily say make a collage like this, and um, be able to manipulate each individual picture as a um, as a separate object. And you know, in this case, let's say we put this other guy on top, but you can change the layer's opacity so that you can see through it like that, right? And, uh, you know, make it look like a, a watermark or something. And there's, uh, let's see, what other kinds of things you can do. There's all kinds of awesome layer effects. Like, let's say, you know, we can give the thing a drop shadow, right? And if we zoom in, you can see the layer's got a drop shadow like this. And we can move it around. The drop shadow follows it. It's attached to that layer. Uh, if we put it back on top, then you can see the drop shadow goes back on top with it. Um, if you add text, hmm. ah, okay, it froze for a second. All right, so we can add text. It's also its own layer here. So you see, now we've got a text layer. And um, we can do all kinds of transforms. We can make it bigger, smaller, rotate it, and manipulate it just like it's. Uh, you know any other um, any other object. Now, before layers existed, once you type something into Photoshop and you hit enter, that's it. It's baked into your image. Now that it can be a separate layer, um, you know you can uh, take it. You can make it another font. You can um, you can add all kinds of uh, um, you know, additional features like this. You know, we gave it a little outer glow, so now you can see it against the background. You can, um, uh, you know, you could change the font, do all sorts of things, whatever the hell you want. Um, so, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Oh, yeah, okay, I see there's like 97 slides. Um, uh, is this? If you go to the bottom left and you see where it's got the, the floor grid. Ah. Oh, okay, well, here, I'll go back to the top and I'll page down. Did I, did I miss it there? Back up one. I thought it was one. <laughs> uh, go forward. One more. Okay, on the middle left. Yeah, open up that one. This one here? Yeah. And the picture in the middle. 
Okay. Copy that. This is the only picture that exists of this particular piece, which is on the front entrance of CIA headquarters. And I'd love to see if you could figure out a way to Okay. Now, um, I'd just like to point out something here. If you, uh, if you watch closely, when I go to uh, file, make a new document, Photoshop um, fills in some numbers for what the um, width and height of that new document is. And by default, it looks on the clipboard. So it will automatically create a new image the same size as what's on the clipboard. So when I go to paste, there it is. It is exactly fitting in the new image. So um, unfortunately, this is very uh, pixelated. And you see there's, uh, there's lots of shadow on it. So um, what I would do in this situation is use an adjustment that I didn't talk about, but it's called Shadow Highlight. And this is a very nice new feature of Photoshop, but um, it's not that universal. So you know, I don't think you can use it in the GIMP or Image Magic. So uh, you know, I didn't talk about it. But see what it did is we've got these light areas here which are pretty much okay already, right? But this area is in shadow and it's kind of hard to see. If I activate this though, then you see the shadow ends up with a lot more detail. And you can um, basically adjust how light you want it by moving this slider. And, and you see it, it pretty much only affects the shadows. And Um, you know, there, there's all kinds of, uh, you know, adjustments. You can just go crazy with it here. Um, but that's, that's what we have. Now, unfortunately, this particular image is um, actually scaled up from a much smaller image. And uh, what I see here is lots of JPEG artifacts. So there's not that much that we can do to recover um, information from it, but um, it depends on what you're looking for. You know, we can look at, say, the different channels and see, well, that shadow is blue, which means we don't see it in the blue channel. What file format do you prefer? Um, uh, okay, so she asked me what file format I prefer. In, in what sense? For, for what purpose? Okay, um, so if I want to scale the image sometimes big, sometimes small, what do I do? Um, well, okay, for one thing, um, you know, I've got a digital camera here. I take pictures with it. What format does that camera save the pictures in? I've got two choices. One is JPEG, which everybody knows and loves, and the other one is what they call RAW format, which is um, proprietary to, you know, to everybody's camera. And this raw format is the best way to, um, you know, actually be able to get everything, you know, extract the last bit of detail out of your image. Unfortunately, um, life's too short for raw. Raw files are uh, are a lot bigger because they, you know, they they're, they don't get rid of data to compress it like JPEG does. So um, so not only are the images bigger, that means that um, you can't fit as many of them on your card. It takes longer to download your card. Um, when you download your card to your computer, it takes up um, more disk space. And uh, if you take a lot of pictures, that disk space starts to add up. You know, I've got a 750 gig uh, disk array, and it's got 30 gigs free. You know, that's, you know, shooting only JPEGs. If I was shooting RAW, you know, I would need two terabytes of disk space. And, um, and then your other problem is most image programs can't open a RAW file. So, uh, Everything can open a JPEG. And so that's, um, that's why uh, you know, I take all my pictures in JPEG. Now, once I've done editing like this, um, I might not want to use JPEG again because that will, you know, creating the JPEG in the first place was lossy. It threw out data. Saving it as JPEG again throws out different data. I might not want to. So I use TIFF. I use TIFF for that. Which one was saving it as PSD? Uh, PSD works just as well. Um, it depends on what I'm going to do with it. Usually I, I uh, save my images to send them to the photo lab and uh, my photo lab 
um, doesn't want PSD files because um, because of all these layers, right? You know, if I turn off this layer here, it's still in the file, but it doesn't show up. So when I save it, you know, I'm saving all of those layers, whether they show up or not. And when the photo lab gets it, they don't know which, you know, if I accidentally turned off this layer or, you know, or if, you know, I want a white image. And so they have to open up in Photoshop, figure out, you know, what it is I really want. And then, uh, you know, I've just sent them a 200 meg file when, uh, you know, a 2 meg JPEG would have given them, you know, the exact same amount of data. I'm just saying I save it as PSD for safekeeping and then make what I need from that. Oh, sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, you can, you can uh, save it as a PSD, um, you know, which, which is great because it keeps all of your different layer settings here. Um, I certainly don't recommend against PSD files, but um, uh, I do a lot of Im uh, batch processing with the uh, ImageMagic suite, and ImageMagic doesn't um, support uh, the Photoshop uh, format very well because it's, it's proprietary. There isn't a lot of good documentation on it, so I just assume um, leave everything in TIFF and JPEG. But uh, by all means, PSD is uh, fairly universal. And it's uh, it's completely lossless, which is pretty much um, something that um, a lot of people like in their image formats. Um, are there any more questions? Yes. Uh, what about like uh, layer masks or something like that? Ah, layer masks. Okay. Well, what he's talking about is I can um, uh, draw a. Let's say uh, you know I draw out an ellipse here. That's uh, that's a selection. You know, I can delete it or move it around, whatever. Uh, what I can also do here is create a layer mask. So what I've done is, um, you know, I created a selection, turned it into a layer mask, which basically um, <coughs> means that uh, you see everything here that's uh, that's white on the mask is what shows through for this layer. Everything that's black shows through the background. And you saw how I created it just by having a selection and clicking here. And of course, you know, you can go back, you can, um, you can uh, change it, disable it to see what your image was like. Um, all right, does that answer your question? Like, um, Oh well, um, specifically for for something like uh, something like that. Now, in this case, that seems like a you know it's it's pretty pointless. But uh, sorry. Allow me to demonstrate. Okay. Does anybody know what a vignette is? Okay. So uh, that's basically taking the images and making it fuzzy. So. Uh, I will show you this, and then I will be done. Um, select feather, five pixels. Okay, so now instead of having a, a sharp outline, see there's a nice fuzzy outline. And that's, um, you know, that's pretty much the primary use of um, layer masks, as far as I can tell. Do you use a layer mask to expand colors in something? No. Uh, no. Um, I, I can show you how afterwards. I can show you one. This is from an infrared camera. Oh, okay. Oh, great. Um, yeah, well, uh, you, you guys can probably turn on the lights because this is sort of over. But... Um, The way, uh, the way these cameras work is instead of having a CCD or, or CMOS image sensor, they have like a, a, an array of, of little um, metallic um, heat sensors, basically. And so the, the lens focuses the infrared light onto the little heat sensors. They heat up and... Um, okay, so uh, is this... Like one of the these cameras are expensive though. They start out at like 
five thousand and go up to like fifty thousand. Is it is is it uh, liquid cooled or, uh, or no, room temperature? Stuff. It's all solid state. There's no cooling necessary. Oh uh, well, just just to get higher precision. Yeah. You can cool it. Okay, so um, let's. It's right. Okay, so um, so when you say expanding the colors, what did you mean by that? To see a difference, like at the bottom of the feet, where it's hot and cold. How it ah. There. Okay. Good. See, so what I did, I went into levels and changed the gamma. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Feel free to hand out those tickets. <laughs> So, um, okay, so does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess. Okay. Well, here, I will. Stop my thing here. All right. Let other people. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, you can come up and ask me questions. I just have to uh, let somebody else use the room.